Uh, so I'm going to get things started just a few seconds early because I want to announce a few items to the forum. First of all, we have uh, Brian Wergener from Twelve River Keepers, and I think he's an amazing speaker. If you were watching OPB last night, he was uh, featured uh, there, and it's just like, hey, I saw you on TV last night. You'll be on TV again. Uh, one of the things that I think is really amazing is that we've uh, financially turned the forum around. We have a backstop of about $3,000 that we keep in a money market, but we have just a little over $6,000 in our checking account. And if I recall our 2010 season, what I think is really amazing is we have an $1,800 bill from uh, that we've basically kicked over to the next season because we were really down on the cash. Uh, I want to thank a couple people, especially John Tyner and Joseph Tyner, uh, also John McWilliams, uh, all of the board, because we've been able to successfully turn around the finances of this organization. I think that's wonderful. So of course, since we've got money in the bank, I want to spend it, and we're going to do that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I want to do that on a little bit of advertising, so people can see us in the uh, out in the real world, the uh, the media, the Oregonian, uh, maybe some online ads. I uh, want to let uh, you know that I did take the liberty with uh, a, a consult of uh, our county auditor, John Hutzler, to apply for a grant for $1,800 for advertising. And about a week or so, we will see the Cultural Coalition of Washington County announce the grant applicants. And I'm also on the grant review board. Why I wanted to say this publicly is I will recuse myself of reviewing my own grant. But I wanted to get that out in public and let you know that on your behalf, I have asked for some additional money for the forum. I just think that grants are a great way to go. And I would seek that all members of the uh, Washington County Forum, whether regular members or board members, who would like to assist in writing grants, please volunteer. And that's my call to action, that we do have a lot of volunteer opportunities for the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. We do a lot of things behind the scenes, such as messaging the, the media, write press releases. Uh, uh, there's a lot of technical work. And if you, even if you're unskilled at that, one of the things I'm doing currently with the amazing Joseph Tyner, is he's, as my intern who's waving at you, is uh, if you don't have the skills, we'll help you develop those. Uh, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, there's a gentleman I don't see in the room quite yet. His name is Al Falcone. He is assisting us with developing a slate for the next season's forum officer. So if that volunteer work is just pounding on a table and being angry at a board meeting, well, you could be one of our board members and pound on the table and be angry. And that's, all the, that's really all the effort that it takes, and we'd love to have you pound on the table. Um, I also want to extend a uh, thank you to somebody I do see in the room, and that's Mr. Patrick Wheeler. Oh, I do have your attention. Uh, at uh, a future uh, meeting that we've got coming up, we have uh, Chris Anderson, who's the publisher of the Oregonian, had a wonderful email dialogue with his uh, assistant over a meeting protocol. And I think this is just an outstanding representation of the type of programming that we need to be producing. And it was from a recommendation from a forum member where that came from. So Patrick, I'd like to thank you again, because I think that's exactly what we need to be seeing at the podium. So very shortly, we'll have Brian come up. I want to uh, also um, uh, let you know that uh, um, I had a couple of concerns and complaints from some of the forum members about the length of questions in our Q&A sessions. So uh, if we don't have a huge line of people stacked up, I'm not going to police that too heavily. But it is at the discretion of the president to kind of rein things in. So if that becomes a problem, um, we'll cut your mic or we'll uh, just ask you to move away. That being said, I want to let you know that uh, this is a lot of fun for me, being your president and seeing how this organization has come together and accomplished a lot of things and its longevity since 1956. It's really been an amazing eye-opener for me and I'm privileged, flattered, just honored to be a part of it. And I want to thank you all for that opportunity. What I'd like to ask you to do next is please put your hands together for Mr. Brian Wergener, our amazing speaker. Thank you for that. Welcome. Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about Twalton River Keepers. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and I can't see. How do I advance this, Eric? I'm going to help you out. That freezes. Um, that disappears. You should be good. There we go. Okay. Twalton River Keepers is a nonprofit organization. We're, our, our mission is to protect and restore the Twalton River system. And when we talk about the system, we mean everything that's connected to the river, like uh, the 
streams and the 712 square miles of land that drain into the river. And it's that through those interconnections that we can only have a healthy river. We have about 700, I think it's 760 now, member families who support us with their annual dues. We have a staff of four. We have programs in recreation, our very famous canoe and kayak trip uh, trips. We probably, we're getting close to 20,000 people have, a, have uh, participated in our in our canoe and kayak trips over the years. We have an education program that is a summer camp in uh, at Dirksen Nature Park in, in Tigard and then uh, a field trip program for schools that we serve a thousand students at. We've done some great restoration projects with Metro on uh, some of their green spaces sites. And then I work in the public policy and advocacy uh, part of the organization. So I want to talk to you about stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff is, is the water, when it rains, it hits the parking lot here and it runs down the gutter and, and ends up in the nearest creek through a, uh, because it goes through a storm drain like this and through a pipe, ends up in, in the, the nearest creek and eventually the Tualatin River. And so it's the biggest source of pollution in the river and these urban creeks. And uh, some of those pollutants that are contained in there are generally the things that drip off cars, whether it be uh, asbestos or copper from the brake, uh, brake linings or uh, oils, oil and gasoline that drip off or tire dust. Um, and all, all of these things are harmful to the life that lives in our creeks. Uh, the other problem with we have with stormwater runoff is we have a more frequent flooding more, and higher, quicker rising floods. This is a picture of Hall Boulevard in uh, 1996 where Fano Creek crosses it in Tiger. Here's just upstream. Uh, one of the things you know about, uh, we learned about this stormwater runoff is that the, the creeks rise real rapidly and if you notice this, it's typical of an urban creek is that the, the, the banks of the creek are deeply incised, real straight walls, because the water comes through real fast and, and causes a lot of erosion. And in that picture, there's, there's three different storm drains coming into the creek right there off of Main Street and Tiger. And this is a hydrograph. Uh, uh, and it's typical of a big storm we, we would have. Uh, this is from Fano Creek and shows that on November 2nd, there was three cubic feet per second flowing in Fano Creek. We had a couple showers, and then finally the big storm hit, and then on uh, November 7th we had 900 cubic feet per second of water gushing through uh, Fano Creek, and that can cause a whole lot of erosion. Uh, stream banks get eroded. This is in Fano Creek Park in Tigard. Uh, and, and part of the reason why this is, is um, we have a what's called a separate storm sewer system. Uh, in Portland, you've heard of the Big Pipe Project where they spent one and a half billion dollars to create this storage vault underground to store all the stormwater runoff because their water goes to the sewage treatment plant. And then when, when they get a storm, the, sewer, the combined sewers uh, overflow because they don't have the capacity to store it and, and pollutes the Willamette River. In our system, the, the, the storm drains are connected directly to the nearest creek. So, uh, every time it rains, uh, any amount that would cause runoff, you will have you will have this polluted water running into the nearest creek. The other part of the, the uh, problem, why we have have this problem, is because we've changed the landscape. On the left uh, here, you see Haynes Falls on the Tualatin River up in the Coast Range. Uh, lots of trees and vegetation that are absorbing, uh, intercepting the rain as it falls. Then compare that to Main Street down in Tiger, where you have rooftops and asphalt. Uh, where the water just runs off uh, rather rapidly. Some people think that, that runoff uh, is a natural phenomenon, but it's not really in our, in our northwest uh, climate. Here, uh, this is a study from a study done by University of Washington, where they took a watershed, a whole area that drained into one creek, and they measured all the rain that fell for one year, and they, uh, they looked where that rain went. Well, a quarter of it went back up into the air through evaporation or transpiration from the plants. 30% um, of it was in the shallow groundwater system, the interflow, where it will take a matter of hours or days before it reaches the nearest creek. And then 15% of it went into the deep groundwater system, but 30% of the rain that fell that year went 
was uh, surface runoff that instantly went into the nearest creek. Then they, met, they, they said, while they were doing that, they were making the same measurements on a forested, uh, forested watershed, and the surface runoff there is only 0.3 percent instead of 30 percent, a factor of 100 less. Groundwater got a whole lot more, 36.6 percent instead of just 15 percent, and then the additional additional evaporation also from the trees. So. What I'm just going to show you here is, uh, is some aerial photos from the Cedar Mill Creek watershed illustrating how quickly we can transform that landscape from a forested landscape to an urban landscape. This, uh, those blue dotted lines you see are the creeks that run through that watershed. And uh, this is how it looked in 1984. All that dark area is, is trees. And over a matter of years, uh, the development happened. The forests were cleared. Houses and roads were built, buildings, commercial areas were built, and finally by 2002, it looked like that. So, the question is, do we have any of that happening in our near future? Well, we're, we are developing some new areas that have been brought into the urban growth boundary, uh, particularly uh, around here, Cooper Mountain is under planning right now. Uh, a little bit ahead of that schedule is is North Bethany, where uh, there, there will be an ordinance considering whether or not they can uh, build on steep slopes. And uh, so we're planning, we're in the planning stage for these newly urbanized areas. And the challenge is, how do we do that without causing the same kind of problems we have in the past? It's a real challenge here on Cooper Mountain because the soils here are very shallow. They're slow draining soils, our clay soils like we have, have uh, throughout the valley. but but the, the bedrock is real close to the surface. Also, there's a lot of trees still on there that are going down already as areas are clear cut in, in advance preparation for that development that's coming. And so the stormwater impacts are, are significant. And I can show you um, a little case history on what happened on South Pole Mountain. South Pole Mountain, the same kind of thing happened. When they developed, they, they cleared the land to make room for development. It's easier to develop if there aren't trees in your way. So that, that takes that natural sponge of tree canopy that absorbs that stormwater runoff or intercepts it and replaces it with rooftops and asphalt uh, streets and concrete driveways and sidewalks, which are all connected to storm drains. Now, the downstream impacts of that, people in King City are quite familiar with, um, with what, has, what has happened since the development of, of South Pole Mountain. Here's one property, rural property owner who lives downstream from that, and this, this big uh, erosion in the creek that runs through his property has all happened since the development of Bull Mountain when uh, additional stormwater runoff has come. And, and then, uh, even if you're not developing it uh, with urban development, the agricultural areas, because they clear cut, uh, they clear the trees, they re recontour the land, they put in drains to, to uh, drain the water, underground drains. And so this is an area, that's a Tualatin River at the bottom there. Uh, there's a, a farming operation on the top, and, and in between there, there's a nice, nice forested cover. This is right across the uh, river from the, the National Wildlife Refuge. So in 2009, it looked like this. In 2011, you can see this massive landslide in the middle. Um, and Oregon Department of Agriculture went and, and looked at that, and they didn't find it. They just found that it was normal, normal farm, farming operations that were contributing to this. And uh, here's, here's what it looks like from a canoe on the river. Um, so significant erosion landslide caused by runoff from Bull Mountain. Took another pictures of, uh, this is from a residential area on the top of Bull Mountain. Um, and these two storm drains are about 50 feet from each other. They are connected to this storm sewer, and, hole, and, and they flow now. This gully that you see uh, Dr. Whitney standing in is, is a 10 feet deep at places, which uh, this is just from the runoff from the street. Uh, at this new development. And this is in a natural area that was 
acquired with the Metro Green Spaces funds. This, the remedy for this to prevent further erosion was pretty expensive and not that beautiful. Uh, you can see there's some large boulders placed in there and then this big one foot diameter storm drain pipe that rushes it, keeps the water from eroding the hill, but then rushes it down to the creek at the bottom of the hill. <coughs> and once again, I, this is the uh, Cooper Mountain area that's being planned for urban development. The South Cooper Mountain area is the area that's going to be developed first. The North Cooper Mountain area is uh, pretty well established in large uh, residential lots and I suspect not much change happening in the near future. The central area has a lot of, a lot of creeks, trees, natural resources and the, we're making the, a lot of efforts to protect those areas and perhaps expand the uh, Cooper Mountain Nature Park. So the question is, how do you, how do, you do this? How do you ur urbanize an area without without causing these stormwater and erosion and pollution problems? Well, first, you avoid building on steep slopes. Water runs faster down the slope than it does on a flat uh, level ground. Large buffers along streams, the other recommendation coming, these are coming out of uh, NOAA Fisheries and, and uh, University of Washington studies they did over the last 30 years up in uh, Puget Sound. And, and for Washington County, we have a pretty good program with Clean Water Services Design and Construction Standards required that, uh, that you have buffers that protect a creek. Uh, depending on the size and the slope, they, they're variable, but if it's a big area along the river, maybe up to 200 feet. If it's, if it's a small creek uh, or just small wetland that doesn't have a lot of slope, it may be only 15 feet. But uh, um, these buffers, are we well, have a good policy in place already to help do that. Minimize impervious cover. So, if you're building a house and you want a 3,000 square foot big house, you can do that as a sprawling ranch house or you can do that as a three-story house and have a much smaller footprint. So if you reduce the amount of roof area, you reduce the amount of stormwater runoff. And other ways of reducing impervious cover, like uh, um, different materials you can use that, that allow the water to soak into the ground. Harvest the rain on the site. You know, in, in islands up in Puget Sound, uh, like uh, the islands up there, the San Juan Islands and the and those where they're they're on these basalt rock islands, they can't drill a well. They don't have a, a glacier upstream that they can get their water supply from. So they use cisterns on these islands. Cisterns are big tanks that capture the the rain uh, as it falls, and and then they process that to make it safe and drinkable. Well, that's a kind of uh, way of harvesting rain. A simple way. Rain barrels are another very simple but small scale way, but harvesting rain on the site is one way you can capture that rain, put it to a good use, and not let it become a problem as stormwater runoff. And then increase uh, maintaining the tree canopy. If we can make our neighborhoods act like a forest does when it manages stormwater runoff, that's a good thing. Now, 60% tree canopy is the recommendations that came out of out of uh, the scientists from Puget Sound. And that sounds pretty significant. But in some areas, we're pretty close to that. This is a residential neighborhood in Lake Oswego, 1,000 acres. They uh, are actually, it's four different neighborhoods. And they're averaging 52% tree canopy. So for a residential neighborhood, that's, that getting to 60% is, is quite possible. Another, uh, the city of Durham, which is kind of over there by um, uh, Bridgeport Village Shopping Center. Uh, the whole city limits, within the city limits, they have 54% tree canopy. And they can do that because they, and, and the green line is their city limits. It's largely a residential area that really, the community there really formed around, we, we like trees, we like big trees, and this is the place we want, the way we want to live. So it's quite possible for planting new areas like Cooper Mountain that you could come up with a forestry plan that has a significant amount of tree canopy. The other thing is, uh, how much impervious cover do we have? Well, and, and we want to look at not just the newly developed areas, but the areas that we've developed uh, over, over the last 150 years. This, is, this map comes from uh, the Clean Water Service's Healthy Streams Plan. Uh, they did a study. They measured how much impervious cover, impervious cover like rooftops or pavement, where the water doesn't, the rain doesn't soak into the ground. In the green areas, is forested, and it's less than 10% effective impervious area. The gray areas was a, 
was a farmland. They didn't include that in their study, but then the other colorful areas are the urban areas. And it's in like downtown Beaverton, you're over 50% effective impervious cover. So over half the land is covered with something that won't let the rain soak in. And you can see that that pattern tends to run along the transportation system along I-5, 217, and Highway 26 is where the densest uh, impervious cover is. So the question is, how can we, in these areas that are, have been developed over the years at great expense, how can we reduce the runoff from those areas? Well, looking at, at what that, that impervious area consists of, this was a study done by U United States Geological Survey back in 2007 where they looked at six different urban watersheds across the nation, and they found that the impervious cover in those, uh, on average, was 29% buildings, 28% roads, and 25% parking lots. Uh, little, Clean Water Services did a study back in uh, 2000 that, that kind of looked at the same thing. And the, the mix is a little bit different there. We, clearly buildings were the, uh, the biggest area, just like in the national study, with almost 8,000 acres of rooftops that are uh, catching stormwater or rain, catching rain, and then over 5,000 acres of parking lots, and then uh, the roads were just 2,300 acres, sidewalks 1,000 acres. So a little bit different mix. Parking lots is a more significant uh, amount of that of uh, that impervious cover here in the Tualatin Basin. And the nice thing about Google Earth is you can take pictures of any place in the valley and see what, it, what it's covered with. And Washington Square is just one illustration of how much pavement can be in an urban area, and pavement and rooftops that, that really doesn't allow the rain to soak back into the ground. So I showed you earlier that study from University of Washington that said urban areas will have 30% runoff, uh, forested areas have virtually no runoff. So the question is, how in these urban areas can we make them behave more like a forest and reduce their runoff? Can we use trees? And we looked at parking lots because parking lots were such a significant part of the, uh, the impervious cover in the Tualatin Basin uh, as a potential for uh, using, making it look like a forest and reducing the stormwater runoff. This is a parking lot at Walmart in South Carolina. You see the Walmart store, but that forested area is parking lot. And so I, I saw this at a presentation last June and I was just thoroughly inspired. I said, wow, Walmart can do the right thing and put plant a forest in a parking lot. Why can't we all? This is in South Carolina. We grow trees in Oregon much better than they can in South Carolina, I'm sure. So here's how a tree works when, when it's intercepting rain. The rain falls, it hits the leaves. Some of that evaporates right from the leaves. Some of that is absorbed by the trees, goes through the stem down into the ground. It, on the ground, all those leaves that fall off the tree creates this spongy mulch stuff that's really good at storing water. Also, the roots of the trees break up the clay soil and allow the water to soak in further. So through all those kind of things, uh, the leaves, the roots, the trunk, the, and, uh, and the detritus that falls underneath it, we have a really good stormwater management tool. Now, if we want to put trees in parking lots, it's not always an easy thing. And here's one example why. Uh, this was a picture taken after a hurricane somewhere on the East Coast. Um, you can see that under the parking lot, they compact that soil really hard to support all the weight of the cars and trucks and the pavement that goes in the parking lot so it does, your parking lot doesn't crumble. And it's really hard for tree roots to get through that. So that's one of the problems we have is that in parking lots, uh, it's really hard for tree roots to get through compacted soil that is needed to support the weight of the cars and trucks that go on it. Another problem is if you have enough trees in a parking lot, um, to, to give you a complete canopy to intercept all the rain, there may not be any place to park then. So this is one extreme example of how that might look. So those are a couple, a couple of the issues we're dealing with. And then 
Uh, sometimes the best laid plans uh, don't work out as well. Sacramento, they were more interested in, in the uh, cooling effects of trees than they were in stormwater, but stormwater is a benefit. And so they required, back in 1983, that all new parking lots be planned so that they have 50% shade coverage from trees within 10 years. And so um, when they went back 10 years later to see how results were, they, the average parking lot shade was 22%, not 50% st uh, stipulated by or ordinance. So just because you make an ordinance that says you have to have tree coverage in parking lots doesn't mean it's really going to happen. I also talked with one of the researchers on this story, uh, on, on this study, and she said, well, the average was really not good. There were quite a few of the parking lots that really did achieve that 50% uh, uh, shade requirement, so it really is possible. And this is another example, street trees where, you know, if trees don't thrive in a place where there's there's no, there's no uh, place to get their water to let their roots grow. And I think this, this is down in South America someplace, but um, a tree that's really struggling to grow in, a, in an urban environment. So what trees need is a lot of volume for soil. Big trees need more volume of soil. And uh, here's an illustration that kind of says that. A tree with a 10-foot crown requires 100 cubic feet of soil. A tree with a 20 cubic, a 20 foot crown requires 500 cubic feet of soil, and a tree with 30 foot crown requires 1,000 cubic feet of soil. Now, um, here's a local example. If you know, next to I-5 uh, over in Tiger area is uh, Sequoia Parkway, where there's uh, a business park. Um, and Home Depot's over there is the big anchor tenant there. Uh, the city forester in Tiger did this study where he went out and because uh, he knew when all these trees were planted and he knew how much soil was on. So these two trees that are illustrated here, the one in, up front, uh, are, they're the same species of tree, same variety of tree, had only 450 cubic feet of, of soil for their tr tree roots, while the one with the trunk that's twice as thick had 2,000 cubic feet of soil. So based upon this study, the city of Tigard adopted standards last year where the minimum uh, in their tree code, when you plant a tree, required, the required landscaping is you have to also, uh, in, in a parking lot, you have to have 1,000 cubic feet of soil provided with that to make sure these trees will survive well. So I, I spoke about the challenges of, of having a parking lot where you compacted soil and one of the things that the, uh, the parking lot owners do, they, they, they'd be happy to provide 10,000 cubic feet of soil for the trees if they didn't lose any parking spaces. So we want to look at a way that you can plant these trees in a way that they will thrive, but they don't take up so much space that they're losing these valuable parking spaces. And so Cornell University did some pioneering research starting about 15 years ago um, on what's called structural soil. and then. Virginia Tech and, and UC Davis also, also did some research on this. And structural soil, there we go. structural soil is, is an interesting mix. It's normally in, a, in under a parking lot, they're going to put some gravel, real fine gravel, quarter minus and like, and compact that real hard so it supports the load. With structural soil, instead they use large gravel. They don't put the fine stuff in there. The large gravel, inch, inch or bigger uh, pieces of gravel. They can compact that. It will, it will uh, support the weight just like the fine gravel will. But it has a lot of space in between it, between those rocks. So those, that space can be filled up with soil. So the structural soil, they, they use large gravel. They fill up this, mix it with soil. And that way, the tree roots have a place to go, uh, and you still can compact the, the, uh, the, the structural soil so it, um, so it supports the parking roots, or parking lot. So here's, here you have a tree planted, and then underneath the cars is that structural soil where the tree roots can expand into. Um, and th this is a recipe in case you want to go home and make some. Uh, that city of Olympia did, where they mixed four cubic yards of crushed rock 
one cubic yard of organic soil, and then a, then you add various uh, ingredients to enhance the soil, make it so it doesn't wash away, um, and uh, add some water, mix it up, and put it in the ground. So I went to Google Earth a few years ago, and I, well, I read this. City of Olympia has this great study online telling about what they did. On one side of the street, they dug up the sidewalk and they planted these trees in the structural soil, those three trees on the bottom. On the other side, they just pulled off the sidewalk and planted four trees in the compacted soil that was there. Eight years later, I went and grabbed this picture, from this aerial photo, showing you the difference in eight years of those trees, same species, just parked, planted across the street and using structural soil. So we got a grant, 12th and River Keepers applied for a grant from DEQ and EPA to demonstrate this structural soil, how we can plant trees in the parking lots to intercept stormwater and also without losing parking spaces. And we hired some engineers and, and designers to help us do this. And we have completed, just about completed, uh, two projects, one project completed, in which we did just that. And at Sunset Swim Center, uh, just over by Highway 26, uh, across, from Sun, across the street from Sunset High School, we did this. We have, in the center lane where we uh, planted the trees, we have rich organic soil. For four feet on either side of that, we have structural soil under, underneath the pavement. And, and 12th and Hills Park District uh, plant, used uh, this concrete that lets the water run through. So that's porous concrete um, in their parking lot. Another uh, photo of what this looks like. And we're expecting that these trees will grow up and shade the parking lot and intercept a lot of rain. But there is no stormwater runoff from this parking lot between the tree wells, which our project was, and the porous, porous concrete that allows the water to run through the pavement. Um, no, there will be no runoff from this parking lot. Porous concrete kind of looks like uh, Rice Krispie treats. Uh, yeah. You know, normal concrete, you have, you have gravel, you have Portland cement, the glue that holds it together, and you have sand or some kind of fine material that fills up the voids. So with this porous concrete, you take out that sand, the fine material, and you just have the gravel and the, and the uh, Portland cement, and so it creates a lot of space that the water can run through. And uh, 12th Hills Park District has completed two parking lots with this. Uh, City of Beaverton has been, done a lot of, several projects, uh, several small demonstration projects for that, and, uh, and, and found it really, uh, really, it works. And um, the other thing is they've been doing this around here for about 10 years now, and the improvement in this project, product, making it stronger uh, so it can support bigger loads so you don't need as much material, making it so that the installation costs are, are reduced because the first product they did, they had, uh, they had to lay it down by hand, and they had to cover it up, and there's a lot of hand labor now. Now Evolution Paving Resources out of Salem has a machine that lays it down, so they, the, the labor costs are greatly reduced. Um, so the improvement of this porous concrete product has been great over the last 10 years. Another way of, 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 uh, of planting trees in the urban spaces is to create a vault underneath the sidewalk or the parking lot where, um, where you can plant the tree roots. This is over in Holland uh, where you see they have this, this, this concrete box with those X squared things there and I'll show you. The, then they fill that up with soil that, that will support the growth of trees. Then they put preformed concrete slabs on top of it like a lid on this. So underneath the sidewalk, you have a really great growing medium for trees, and uh, and they planted trees in. And this uh, in the United States, there's a commercial product called what's it called? I forgot what it's called. It's a plastic matrix like this, where they do the same kind of thing. Kind of expensive. We uh, we thought about doing this, and we went with the the uh, structural soil technique. But um, another another way of getting uh, trees to have a lot of good soil in a paved, paved environment. 
So that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. If you have any more questions, um, we are doing a seminar about our pro projects at at, uh, 12, at the Sunset Swim Center with for engineers and landscape architects and public works folks, so they can learn how to do that technique. And and we have, like I said, we have 5,000 acres of parking lot that could use some trees, and hopefully we'll we'll see more projects like this where either through planting trees or porous concrete, or uh, we'll be reducing the stormwater runoff from those 5,000 acres. I, I think uh, John put in the forum member. Um, I think this is what's really interesting the parking lot for you can have all the concrete that absorbs the uh, moisture in me. Uh, who pays for this? Well, uh, you, it's uh, in, in our case with 12 the Hills Park District, they passed the bond measure to do capital improvements. And so they, they paid for the porous concrete. We paid for the trees and the tree wells with our grant. What we find is um, a lot of times, uh, you know, you, the, the costs can go down, depending project by project, it's going to vary. But because you don't have to put in storm drains and uh, storm sewers, in the, you, you reduce the cost by not having those those uh, that infrastructure. So uh, it may not cost you more. Probably will cost you more. But then again, uh, in some places they are uh, like in Portland. If you do a project like this, they will reduce your stormwater fee. You know, a commercial development in Portland, their monthly stormwater fee is based upon how many square feet of impervious cover you have. So if you put in a project like this, you can reduce your your impervious cover by a whole lot and save on your monthly stormwater fee. So sometimes it's the stormwater uh, rate payers that, that will pay for this in a way that, that saves them from building another big pipe project. Thank you, Brad. Very good information. I appreciate the uh, porous cement. I mean, it's almost like everyone should use porous cement for homeowners and everything. What is the expense ratio and what is the life expectancy of porous cement compared to regular cement? Well, um, the uh, that's that's really changing because the product is improving so much. Um, and uh, 10 years ago, they did the first project uh, this type. It was over at Clean Water Services Field Operations Center on Merlot Court uh, over there. And that project, they, they made it really thick because they hadn't used it before and the, top, the surface of it is a little bit crumbly um, but now that they have more experience with it since the product project product is stronger they can do it not not as thick and uh, and it's not as it doesn't crumble like it used to so that's a constantly changing thing still my, my understanding is still costs more than your typical concrete but then again when you throw in the the savings because you reduce the drain and pipes infrastructure you may be you may be looked at it a good thing, and then if if the benefits that the sewer district receives are are passed on to the customer like they do in Portland, um, then then it's a pretty good, a pretty makes economic sense for the property owner. Thank you. Uh, Bill Kroger, forum member, thanks for coming in. That, again, I found it very interesting, also. Uh, are you familiar with the term bioswale? Yes, I am. Yeah, I was. I was just going to say down in Salem, I happen to know because my wife was involved in it. Uh, they put a, a bioswale, the first one actually ever, between a, a big parking lot and a park, huh. and there was a creek running through it. And that it, it was just about a six-foot buffer with bushes and plants and things that they put in there, and it was amazing. It just stopped almost the runoff, all of it from the parking lot. So I was wondering if we had any bioswale kind of things here. We have lots of bioswales here, and in fact. Uh, typically, with new development around here, you will you will see a bioswale, uh, and and uh, we have some good standards. That, you know, the first time you build a bioswale, it's they're not going to perform the way you like. We used to allow them to just put grass in them. Well, the problem with putting grass in a in a stormwater uh, facility is people are going to be fertilizing it, so you're adding that pollutant to the stormwater runoff. You have to mow it and maintain it. And so what they and they found that uh, for some of those facilities, they increase the amount of phosphorus that's getting into the creek, and uh, and phosphorus is a is the critical pollutant around here in the Tualatin Basin. So now, 
they're, they've come up with better designs so that um, they, uh, they don't have standing water, which can produce uh, mosquitoes, and they use a lot of native plants that can uh, that really crowd out the weeds, and uh, so the designs are improvement. The challenge for parking lot owners is that, um, and one of the reasons why we, we went with a structural soil uh, instead of a bioswale is because uh, bioswales take up land, and if, if land is critical value to the parking lot owner, they want to get as many parking lot spaces as they can, so with this structural soil and tree well technology, they can, they can do that uh, in a way that uh, preserves more parking spaces than, than a bioswale. Patrick, we're the farm member. Not sure that uh, Metro and uh, Washington County got the memo, but uh, I'm looking around. I'm seeing all these apartment units plotting up in big area, taking up big areas. And so, where, where are we? I'm trying to take these condos, apartment units, three and four stories, compressed. How do you keep them from having a lot of runoff and other things? And is anything being done about? It? Well, well, one of the benefits of doing a multi-story uh, development compared to a, a single-story development is that there's less <coughs> there's less, less rooftop to cause runoff. So uh, one of the uh, techniques they're using in these kind of developments is cluster development, where they put the townhouses or the apartments really close together, and then they have a lot of landscaping that they can put bioswales or for or or trees to absorb the stormwater runoff. So the trade-offs, the, the trade-offs in those kind of things is that you reduce the impervious footprint, the amount of surface that's causing runoff, and then you can move them closer together so you can have larger spaces that can handle the stormwater uh, that falls on the ground. Hi, Brian. Marilyn McWilliams, uh, forum member. I wanted to ask, um, it seems to be the trend now to put these really skinny columnar trees along the roadways now. And I'm just wondering how they compare with the more native trees that are more spreading and so on in terms of, of <coughs> oxygen production and, and using, you know, and storing water and, and uh, providing homes for birds and wildlife. Well, um, uh, I have a lot of friends who are arborists. And the, the reason they put in skinny columnar trees along the streets is, is to avoid what they call truck pruning. When a truck comes by and prunes the tree for them. So uh, one of the challenges that, uh, that there's a lot of challenges in selecting a tree in an urban paved landscape because the parking lot's asphalt parking lot is going to be hotter than, than a concrete parking lot. And so not all trees can handle that heat. Um, and and uh, if there's traffic coming through, you don't want to block the site of the traffic. So some of that can be done with the selection of what kind of tree you put in. Some of that you uh, it, you do with pruning. Uh, with stormwater runoff, you know, um, there's there are several studies here, and I, I don't know if I we have our rainfall is typically in the spring, winter, fall, and the summer is really dry. But the trees, the deciduous trees, have their leaves on in the dry season uh, more than they would in the rainy season. So. Um, there were a couple studies, this one in Berlin, that showed that where they have a similar climate issue is uh, the different species of trees on how well they were at intercepting rain. And there was one study from uh, Sac Santa Monica where they, um, they compared uh, sweet gum trees, which are deciduous and, and produce beautiful colors this time of year, with a camphor tree, which is a broadleaf tree, but it's an evergreen tree, so it keeps its leaves on during the winter. And uh, um, the winter rainfall interception uh, for the evergreen tree ran from 20 to 60 percent kind of range. And the winter, uh, the sweet gum trees was only around 5 or 6 percent. And so that's one of the other choices. The other advantage of, of planting native vegetation is because it supports the native biological com community. There's lots of different bugs that depend on the vegetation that is natural to here. And the benefit of having, of supporting bugs, you would say, well, don't you want to get rid of bugs? Well, the benefit of supporting bugs is that if you have a diverse variety of insects, you're going to have a whole lot less problems than if you have a monoculture of insects. So if you can support a diverse, uh, diverse population of insects where they're competing with each other, where there's predators and there's prey, and then, 
and uh, you're not going to have a, one kind of species come in and wipe out the whole, the whole forest. So that's one of the benefits of, of, of planting native species uh, in the area. But it's, it's a real challenge because of the heat and the environment of a parking lot or a street that to, to do that and the safety considerations that you have to consider when, when you plant a tree along the street. I'm Barbara Wilson, for a member. Uh, I, I have a question that you may not be able to answer, but I, it's been on my mind for a long, long time, and I don't know who to ask. When I use cleaning uh, products, for example, I'm thinking specifically of silver cream for silver stuff, but also floor cleaner and laundry soap. And I pour that down the sanitary sewer and it goes off to the treatment plant. Is the treatment plant able to settle out that stuff before it goes in the river? Yeah, uh, we have some of the best wastewater treatment plants in the world with, with clean water services. So uh, I, I think what you pour down the drain is is a little bit less of a concern. There are certain things that, that can cause problems, and every once in a while you hear of an industrial spill down the sewer that killed all the bacteria at the sewage treatment plant that's supposed to be digesting all this stuff. So they have limits, particularly for industrial customers, uh, of what you can put down the drain. Uh, restaurants, they don't want you putting grease down the drain because that plugs up the sewers, but most of your household pollutants, it's pretty good at, at um, removing those things before it gets to the river. In fact, there's, there's fewer pollutants in the effluent from the sewage treatment plant than there is in the river itself. The only issue is that it's a little bit warmer than the river water, so uh, they have ways of dealing with that temperature impact. You know, a couple, a few years ago, the state of Oregon passed a regulation that said in urban areas you can't use um, a dishwasher detergent that has phosphorus in it, high phosphorus detergent. And that's because phosphorus really causes algae blooms. It's, it's like, it's fertilizer. And it fer when that fertilizer gets in the water, it causes the algae to bloom and grow really fast. And, that's, and that produces a lot of oxygen while it's growing. But some of those algae are toxic, uh, produce toxins. And then when the algae finishes growing, it, and usually some hot summer day, when all that algae dies at one time, then when it decays, it consumes oxygen. And you can have fish kills because there's no oxygen left in, in the water because of uh, the decaying algae. And we, we had an issue out at Wapato Lake a few years ago, 2008, where the algae bloom was killing fish and frogs. So, but Clean Water Services harvests, harvests that, that uh, phosphorus from their plant. And so, um, really, the amount of phosphorus you put down a drain in a Washington County urban uh, is not is not really an issue because they're going to take it they're going to take it out and make fertilizer out of it. So, um, we have some good so wastewater treatment plants, but there's certain things you don't want to put in anything. You, know, you don't want to dump gasoline or grease or any uh, really harmful stuff down the drain. Yeah. And Metro has a has a has a good system for helping you dispose of that in a safe way. Yeah, hi, John, kind of board member. I don't know if you can handle this question. We touched on it, but um, in uh, 10 years ago, I was driving through uh, California and I heard a mayor you know, from Arizona talking about the extraordinary heat buildup that was occurring in the Arizona cities, Phoenix, like Havasu, and Tucson, and that it and got, the, the, it got so prohibited that people were leaving because of the incredible heat things. And then I saw an article that indicated they're putting trees in there not just to soak up the heat, but also when it rains, it, it scours. The banks because it rains all at once. They put in the metal, they put in the concrete things. It goes down, just has incredible velocity. People drown. There you see rescue operations in their yeah. things. Uh, is there a synergy between our climate and their climate with regard to the technology of, of forestation and um, and water control? That is there a synergy that can be created between the, two, the problems of the two areas, which are somewhat related, but some, but still somewhat separate. Ours and theirs. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, in urban areas, no matter where you are, you're going to have the heat island effect. So, uh, so planting trees is one way of dealing with that. The uh, the uh, the and and uh, the stormwater problems are similar too. The other the challenges are down in the desert southwest. They're not going to be able to grow as many variety of trees as we are up here. Uh, and then the soils are can be quite different. I mean, some areas, desert areas, like in eastern Oregon, where this 
the water just drains through the soil rather rapidly. Here we have clay soils that, that drain uh, slow. So yeah, there are synergies, but you can't, you can't, you got to really design for the climate, the soil, and uh, and the environment that you're going to be in. Uh, Uh, Rod Bunnell, forum member. Uh, we live in a rural area that's being urbanized, and our, our neighbor's uh, five-acre pasture across the street has recently <coughs> developed into a uh, housing uh, development with uh, uh, ten homes and a street down the middle of it. And on, on the, the downhill corner, they've installed what they call a swale. And this appears to be a, an excavation uh, maybe 120 feet long and 12 feet wide, a uh, line uh, concrete walls, and uh, in the bottom there appears to be standing water and a, a good uh, stand of uh, swamp grass. Can you explain what, what the purpose of that is and, and what that accomplishes for uh, uh, drainage purposes? Well, I, I, I suspect that's what's called a detention facility, which is supposed to slow down the water uh, during a storm event and, and meter it out uh, at a slower rate so it causes less erosion in the creeks. Uh, there are engineers who really don't believe in, in detention because you may slow it down. For example, if you, if, you, if you put a detention facility in this parking lot right here and you slow down the water so that you, it doesn't all gush into the creek at the same time, by the time that creek reaches the Tualatin River, there's going to be some water that's come from far upstream that's going to be meeting with it. So the peaks the peak uh, flow in the river comes at a different time than it does in the creek, and so detention is really hard to do effectively. And so what, what EPA and DEQ are encouraging new stormwater regulation is to not detain, but retain water. That means soak it into the ground, harvest it for a, a beneficial use, or get it evaporated back in the air, rather than just slowing it down as it goes down the pipe to the creek. Chris Leslie, former member. The idea of trees. Uh, my neighbors are having problems with pine trees, the needles and everything. And then I have problems with leaves from the poplar trees. Can you name good trees that won't require the car to be washed all the time? Uh, you know, we, we had a pine tree that was sick that was dropping sap on our cars, and finally my, my wife, after years of complaining about it, we got it <laughs> taken out. So trees, you know, any kind of solution has its costs and benefits. Um, and, and, and a certified arborist is, are the kind of folks that really are the expertise for putting the right tree in the right place. Um, and th that's who I would consult with if, if, uh, if you're having a tree that's a problem, what, you, what kind of tree you might want to replace it with or prune it in a different way or fix it uh, that way. But certified arborists are but for the city to do it, or the county. Oh, and for so this, uh, you. Uh, what kind of trees do you recommend for your parking? You know, uh, the city, uh, I work with Tigard on their new tree ordinance. They have a list of approved trees that are good for street trees, and and you can uh, you can go on the website or go down to city hall and, and get that list, and so they have trees that they will recommend that are better than others for those kind of problems. And uh, also, uh, if, if you can talk to the city forester and they describe your area, what, what they, they can probably give you a better idea of what specifically would work right for your, for your situation. It's very interesting. It, it varies from city to city. I'm more familiar with Tigard because that's where I live. And um, <coughs> Tigard has, uh, if your home was built in the last 20 years or so, uh, there was a requirement with that development on planting trees. And so those trees that were required with that development are protected and you need a permit. My house was built 30 years ago and, um, and there was no requirement. I, it's covered with trees. 
but I, if I cut down a tree, I don't need a permit. So the regulations vary uh, greatly from city to city. And quite often those cities, uh, I know Tigard every fall they have a, a free tree kind of giveaway. So if you, if you need to take away a tree, they can help you get a new one. Some of the regulations, you know, they give you a permit to take out the tree. And, uh, um, and then they may have some mitigation requirements that they may not. But it's, it varies uh, from city to city. Well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. You had great questions, and uh, I got one more. Oh, Eric's got one more. Okay, Eric Squire's for a member. Uh, a lot of uh, the advocacy is behavior based, uh, whether or not it's a, uh, a developer or a citizen to do or not do something. From the lens of a developer or a citizen, what would be the number one thing that either one of them could do to improve the Tualatin River? Well. Best benefit. You know, a, a, a lot of you you see a lot of talk of, about uh, how individuals can make a difference in the environment. You know, don't use plastic bags or individual. In my line of work, I, I look at how we can do things collectively as part of public policy. And so, um, what I'm looking for right now is things that can make the Twelfth River better. There's a stormwater permit coming up from DEQ that that tells the cities and Clean Water Services what how they need to improve that stormwater, uh, uh, reduce the stormwater runoff. And then Clean Water Services is doing design and construction standards reviews. So they will have, when you have a new development coming in, if it's next to a creek, they'll specify how you have to protect that creek. If there's, uh, if you're creating a parking lot or uh, a rooftop, they'll, they'll talk to you about how you can reduce the amount of stormwater runoff that comes through that. So I think uh, the number one thing a citizen can do is get involved in those issues like the design and construction standards where um, you can make a bigger impact than just an individual effort. We can make a collective effort as a community for improving conditions for our creeks in the 12th and River. A couple closing announcements, folks. Uh, next week we have Richard Obernicht from Washington County Assessment and Taxation. He'll be bringing two colleagues and they'll be uh, uh, making a presentation about how assessment and taxation works at Washington County. October 30th, we have State Treasurer Ted Wheeler. For our two upcoming statewide elected uh, forum programs, I would recommend that you uh, arrive early. I think that we may be coming close to capacity for the seating. Uh, in November, we will have Ellen Rosenblum, our Attorney General. Uh, that's another amazing booking. I want to thank John Williams for his outstanding work with the program committee. And then the last one on the agenda was previously announced, and that is uh, um, uh, Chris Anderson, who is the publisher of The Oregonian, and already behind the scenes, the, uh, the chatter, the emails, uh, the phone calls are starting to say, hey, that's a really good program. And I think that uh, with the dynamic nature of uh, uh, the, the press and that organization, just comes to, I'm just amazed. It's, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. That being said, I'm going to adjourn today's program. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week.